Okay. And then let's just do a quick open editor here. If you need to control plus to make it bigger, to yeah, well, no, but then I won't be able to see a screen to make it worthwhile for me as myself either. So, yeah, I don't know. Actually, well, no, I will just make it work. I'll just wait. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm just gonna get started here. Um, so I am gonna show off just like some very basic Kubernetes and then a a batch processing workflow processing system for Kubernetes called Ergo Workflows. Um, and uh, so the project I'm going to demo for you today is a very simple scale out um, batch process that will um, make thumbnails of Linux desktop backgrounds. Um, and so we're just going to read in. I think I downloaded 85 really like corny, cheesy Linux desktop backgrounds. And I uploaded them to a um, Google. Kubernetes engine um, NFS volume. And uh, we're just going to run a real quick little demo where we uh, read in a bunch of uh, um, JPEGs and PNGs and we make them 500 pixels across. So we make a thumbnail of them and we can scale it out to run on multiple nodes at once. So um, I, you know, I assume some folks here are probably pretty familiar with you know, scaling up computing to like run on multiple nodes, running things on clusters. Uh, I assume not everyone is, and I assume some people are very familiar with Kubernetes, and I assume some folks are not so familiar with Kubernetes. So, um, if things seem to be incredibly boring and uh, very much remedial, uh, let me know, and we can we can try some fancier things. I know that uh, Andy said he had a Kubernetes cluster. That he deployed at home, we could try deploying to that. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, no, we didn't get it running. Yeah, tail scale didn't uh, well connect up, so it exists, but we can't get to it. Yeah, well, that's too bad. Well, if uh, well, if uh, things look incredibly silly, we can uh, we can like you know try. Uh, I have three hundred dollars of Google Cloud bucks here. We can <laughs> we can try to uh, we can uh, you know we can try to program something together if if we really run out of things to do it. So. Uh, okay, so um, maybe uh, a great way to start here to know where I should start is um, maybe in the chat and in the room. Maybe could people like uh, give me a quick like intro of what what is your familiar with Kubernetes? I've heard of it. It's too many of us here. Uh, anyone else? Close to zero. Same no, familiar with it. On the other end, Will is like coded it. Yeah. Will also says that he can spin up a cluster in the Lin node if we uh, need it as well. Okay. Well, I, I have a I have a cluster split up in GKE. Six minutes Maybe about it, and I got it for you then. Yeah. So, anyways, I have something running, and I have data uploaded to it. So, I'll, I'll, we can I'll, I'll show what I have, and I know it works for our demo, and I will not tempt the demo gods too much. But uh, if we run out of time, yeah, I'd love to try it in Lin node. I already tested this on Docker Desktop, and it works. On Docker desktop NGKE, so I know it works on multiple clusters already. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to share the code and we can we can dump it on whatever we want if you know just to show like the magic of Kubernetes and can play it on multiple environments. So uh, did anyone else in the chat say what their title level is? I haven't seen any additional messages other than uh so uh Will says that he works on a distro and helped build K3S. Uh, Matt says no. Okay. Well, I'll start from the very basics, and I, I'll just apologize to Will in advance. Um, so, kind of from what I understand, like the core building block of Kubernetes is what's called a pod, and a pod is a uh, group of containers that swim together essentially. So they they get put on the same node essentially, and uh, the whole the whole idea of Kubernetes is where containers you deploy all these little you know contained, you know, uh, C groups or whatever on a single node. Um, basically, Kubernetes allows you to take all of your container images and just deploy them at a system. And then the system will intelligently uh, allocate containers to different nodes. So you can have just like, you know, 100 nodes, you know, that are networked together and you just deploy your container and you don't have to worry about which server is full and which one is empty so you don't have to allocate yourself. Otherwise, 
you have to be like, well, you know, the system resources on this one node has. Yeah, fallen. I know, but you got food there. I I'm busy. Uh, Ian, I just got done Ian getting home here. I got to the bathroom, so. I am muting you now, Dean. <laughs> For that gets too more on too much more on. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so that's that's the, like the very most basic content. Um, and uh, the, another couple of basic, um, very basic concepts I'll explain too because it has its own jargon and terminology. Uh, a couple others. So um, one level up from you know, so you have container and then you have pod and then you have what's called a deployment. Um, a deployment is essentially like an auto scaling group yeah. slash high availability. So uh, unit, so so that's you know let's say you you know can figure something high availability that like put a pod for each node and like try to where automatically scale so as you get more traffic or load it will automatically add new containers to your to your new pods to your group but you know for host, mostly for hosting web services and whatnot uh, the another for data storage another big kind of important concept is called a persistent volume. So if you want data to survive your pod, so one of the things you're doing Kubernetes, at least I'm doing Kubernetes all the time, is uh, spooling pods up and down and like kind of expanding as things go. Uh, you know, default container land, uh, you know, you have all of your data in your container. And if you spool it up and then you spool it down, you lost your data, right? So the way you usually get around that containers, you should just mount it in. So persisting volume is just a volume you can mount into your container so that when in your pods, so when your pods spool down, your data doesn't go away. So it just out, lives longer than the duration of the pod. You just manage that separately. Uh, and then the other thing that you build do is you build persistent volume claims on top of persistent volumes. And persistent volume claims, um, they're like the logical unit where like persistent volume claim is like the equivalent to the pod where persistent volume is closer to the node. So persistent volumes track more to the physical disk. And the persistent volume claims are the hunk of that disk that each pod claims for itself uh, that can, can live longer than the duration of the pod. So uh, just think of persistent volume more kind of, it's more physical and persistent volume claim more logical. And one of the things you can do nicely there is persistent volume claims, you can just be like, hey, I want 100 gigs of disk. And then you can just give that 100 gigs of disk back to the to the system and it'll, you know, the persistent volume stays, but then you carve out little chunks of it for each each individual pod as you run to go along. So um, yeah, so that's kind of the basic terminology before we go on. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to uh, showing a little bit of the stuff in action? Is the um, persistent storage, does that mean is it still would you use it like S3? Is it still kind of short term? It's, uh, it's, I think it's like, for example, what I have set up here is NFS. So if you're thinking in Amazon terms, um, the default things that Amazon does in their BKS is um, they host persistent volumes on um, yeah. EFS yeah. and then also on uh, EBS. So I think EBS, EFS level. Yeah, well, that's like a net, network file share. Right. So the, the more Kubernetes native way to handle something like S3 is usually taking care of something like called MinIO. Oh yeah, so you could you could yeah. host MinIO um, on EBS or whatever, and then, and you know, can do that. Um, otherwise, I think you can you can you know just target the S3 APIs directly from the pod, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a Linux container. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so what I have up here for for demoing is this is the um, the G uh, Google Compute Engine um, Google Cloud Cloud Show, which is a Linux environment here in the browser, which is kind of fun. They have a persistent, basically Linux in, uh, I think container that they just leave up all the time for you uh, as long as you have an account and they'll just persist any files and data you have here, which I think is kind of slick and nice. And so you can see here, I don't know how well you can read all of this, but um, I have all the source code I want to have. I just uploaded to this thing and it was real quick. And then I have um, all of our images we had. And maybe before I get going too much, um, let me get, yeah, okay. So this is, these are the images we're gonna be playing with today. So before we get, so again, the point of what we're doing is I downloaded a bunch of really campy, corny, dumb uh, Linux themed images here. So like, 
best Linux wallpaper right there. Uh, and we're wiping our that's awesome. <laughs> wiping our Tux's butt with oh. SEO toilet paper. That's, that's an oldie but a goodie. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's kind of what we're doing. So, but notice it's more than 500 pixels. So we're gonna we're gonna make that 500 pixels. That's that's kind of the the goal here. So just to loop everything back around. So yeah, and then getting to the like you know showing off the very basics of Kubernetes here. So I showed off. Uh, we have a um, a uh, I did a get PVC here. I have a PVC created. I did that ahead of time to try to save a little time here. Um, but basically, all I did is use the command line program called Q control. And I said apply dash F to this uh, volume claim here. And this creates a little hunk of NFS. Uh, basically, it creates a full array of NFS here, is what it does. That's that only my pod can see, right? So, uh, one of the nice things about persistent volume claims is you can't see outside of it. So basically created a folder in NFS share. This is literally what it's doing, because this is rewrite many is uses NFS. And you see this is rewrite many. There's also rewrite once, and there's also uh, read many, so you can only read. So those are kind of the basic states. But this is just basically like making a directory and then telling my pod you can't see above this directory. Uh, it's basically all it does. So just to... Um, spool up a, a, a pod here. So in order to see what pods we're currently running, we can do kubectl get pods. We can see there's currently no pods yet. Yes, good. And we can answer your question. So the the code you're you're telling me how this, but that's effectively uh, building the heart. So it's not like it's asking the bot, hey, please don't look at this. It's actually it's kind of it's hardware fashion that it can't see. Uh, it's more like a operating system level. Okay. Not, I wouldn't say hardware level. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um, okay, so, and yeah, so to create a pod here, I have a a nice little one of these files here I was going to show off. I can't see it. There should be like debug pod. Okay, here we go. I have debug pod here. here. My mouse is huge. Okay, so then I have just a really simple little deployment here, and it's going to make a one pod deployment. And it's going to create using Ubuntu 22.04. And the important thing here to notice is the command that I have running for it is sleep infinity. So it's going to do nothing or uh, And then also that we're mounting, um, we're mounting slash a, which is what I how I have that, um, that the, and I have data vol here. And if you look, it'll say thumbnailer data. You put thumbnailer data in slash data, essentially. So thumbnailer data here is you can see what my PVC is. So we're just going to take this thing I already created and we're just going to mount it slash data. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show creating a pod. So I'm going to do kubectl. Uh, there you go. Uh, typing is hard, but I can't see. Okay, so kubectl, and then we're going to do apply dash f, and then we're going to do debug pod yaml. Come on. I might, uh, it, well, we might have to do thumbnailer. Oh gosh, yeah. Thumbnailer debug. There we go. Okay, so now it is actively spinning up a pod right now. Okay, and so it's just I created the pod. So the pod is created. So now when I do get pods, you should see that it created a pod on the cluster and it is running. And then just real quick thing, I have another little shell script here that I made ahead of time, which has um, kubectl exec, which is how you basically that's SSH into the pod I just created. So then what I'm going to do is, oh wait, this is going to be a lot harder with far away. Okay, we're going to my copy and paste. There's probably a nice bash way to do this that I don't remember off the top of my head. So, but anyways, I could just be able to do here now bash and then uh, thumbnailer and then connect the pod. And then let's paste that in. And now we are in the pod, not in the cloud shell. And I can just do a quick ls. And, and the most important thing you see there is uh, now you can see, uh, yeah, and I have everything in the default namespace just for simplicity tonight. Um, but I have ls here. And uh, I, you see there's a slash, there's a data in that folder there, slash data. And if I do ls slash data, you can see there is 
uh, a whole bunch of wallpapers there. And there's already a thumbs folder, which is what the output of our process will be. And so I'm going to do ls slash data thumbs, yeah. and you can see everything again. The thumbs is that, that ugly green uh, box that yeah. was there. Yeah, that's the direction. The capture curve is not doing a good job of capturing that. Yeah, but anyways, thumbs is the bright green thing now. So that's the folder of the output of our process we're going to run. So just for, for kicks and gokuls here, I'm going to do um, rm-rf slash data slash thumbs, and thumbs will go away. And so we'll do ls slash data again, and notice now there's no thumbs. OK, so now we can exit out of here. So this is our quick, fun little pod. And uh, I'm going to leave that running for now. Um, but we can always get back in just by, by uh, you know, uh, having a look. Um, and we can always get back in. When, when we're done, we'll run everything, and we'll look at them. We'll see if we come back. So um, just a real quick, uh, I'm going to run what's called an Argo workflow right now. And the Argo workflow, this is where we get into the having a little bit of a loop in a YAML file. So what a workflow is, is if you think of a deployment as a service you're deploying Kubernetes, a workflow is a batch job which you're deploying Kubernetes. So um, Argo workflows is a like extension for Kubernetes. They, uh, it's not part of the native Kubernetes project. It's an extension that people have written uh, on top of Kubernetes to basically give nice batch jobs. There's also such a thing as a job class in Kubernetes, uh, but it doesn't handle multiple steps. What uh, workflow does here uh, is it allows you to have a batch job with multiple <laughs> steps. And so, uh, and then also distributed acyclic graphs. So uh, here, here what you can see is I have workflow. I have a really simple workflow. But uh, if you look down here, this is where you can kind of see what we're gonna run in order. So we're gonna run uh, if you look to see, it's, if you look really little there, it says steps. So steps defines how, what order things are going to run. Order is much you can see. Yeah, more difficult to do that. Well, how fun. Yeah. Uh, Dan, uh, you uh, have a hot mic again. Okay, so uh, we are going to, the, the, the steps I have here is just a really, really basic, more or less map reduce here. Except I'm not even producing really, I'm just mapping and running everything. So what map does is it's just going to list all of the images in the directory. And what thumbnails is going to do is it's going to run a really simple Python command to um, reduce the size of the image and write it back. Uh, and then you can see here, this is, this is technically my, my loop here. I say run this command, this thumbnail command, over all of the images that are uh, come out of steps, maps, output results. So basically map is going to print to the screen all of the images. And then I'm going to say, run through all the, all the images that get printed out. Um, run, pick, take those as input arguments for the next step that is going to reduce the size of them. And right here, so this is now going to define the uh, which image we're going to use. So I actually um, posted uh, in. GCR is the uh, way you host containers in uh, Google Cloud. And so I just compiled and made my own container and then pushed it up. And then you can see that I have um, thumbnailer data as my command. I just have this thumbnailer pi, which is this thumbnailer pi I'm going to show you in a second. And I'm just passing in the argument map. And then uh, you see here it says for CPU, this is 200 M. M stands for milli CPUs. So basically, this is going to have less than our CPU. So you can have one one thousandth of a CPU, which means basically, if you're like familiar with like time sharing, this is if you have one one thousandth of a CPU, like one millisecond out of every second your, your compute will run, or like one second out of every hundred seconds or whatever that a thousandth is going to run. So it'll just so two hundred uh, uh, milli CPUs just means you know. Uh, it's going to run, you know, a quarter of the CPU, but not quite, twenty percent of the CPU. Um, and so, and then I'm assigning one hundred uh, uh, megabytes. That's what this says right here. So um, the advantage of this is, if you want to grab middle CPUs, you can get slotted onto a node extremely quickly because the scheduler never has to scale up a node because it's really small. And usually, there's at least one CPU free. Um, and so then, for each uh, for each uh, worker node that I'm going to spawn up, I am giving it one CPU and then 500 megabytes of RAM. So, any questions about this, real quick?
and then I'll, I'll show you the code that is actually running. Can you also make it more than a CPU? Oh yeah. So, so um, oh yeah, you can, you can, you can. Alloc so if you let's say the, the only thing that you that you're limited to the maximum node CPU size. So let's say you have no, you have uh, a four node cluster, and each one of them has uh, is a quad core, right? So you, so you have four CPUs, yeah, um, for each uh, for each node. If you try to allocate an eight node job, or an eight, sorry, an eight CPU job on a uh, cluster that maybe it has you know sixteen total um, CPUs, but you, it, it can't schedule across the, uh, okay. the nodes, and so it'll say I can't uh, unavailable, not enough CPU. And we will actually when I deploy this, you'll see. That it, there won't be enough CPU for all of this, and it will actually schedule up. That's one of the magical things you can do is when you deploy this on top of a, a, of a cloud provider, which you can do is you can have the cloud provider automatically rent more nodes for you as you as you need more more stuff. And so um, you know you don't have to pay very much for nodes you're not using all the time. So you basically, as you get more work coming in, you will automatically scale up more nodes and then decommission those nodes. You go up down direction. So, which is really nice, and one of the advantages is, you know, what I look, what I kind of like to do with this. One of the things I like so much about Kubernetes is you can purchase nodes on premise that for your baseline load. And if you know you have, you know, let's say you're a retailer right. and you have Christmas, you yeah. can rent all your Christmas traffic, and then you know every other day that you can buy that what you for that traffic. Yeah. So Will does have his hand up here. Yes, of course. Okay, so general question I have, which is. Uh, if you're going to loop through and let's say you have a bunch of these jobs, have you tried running anything with Helm in order to run like a Helm chart so you can pass workload to it and then just reapply for like uh, deploying different jobs? Or do you like what do you normally do to loop through all the different images that you would have here? So, yeah, so I'm using Arthur Workflows um, for that. That's the product I'm doing. Uh, that's that's what does all of the looping, and I can explain how that works. Um, you may be able to do this in Helm as well. I tried doing it in Helm. Uh, that'd be something interesting. Uh, I would. There's there's multiple other ways you can do this. Um, there are several different products that work on top of Argo workflows, including one called Kubeflow that I think is relatively popular. Um, that that also do these similar kind of things. Um, also, Airflow has very recently announced that they have a native Kubernetes backend for Airflow, so you can also write Airflow jobs and just automatically deploy them to Kubernetes. I haven't tried that out yet. So I would be very interested if someone else wants to take my source code and uh, deploy deploy using a different, um, basically, workflow engine and just take the same Python and deploy it differently on Linux. I would be very interested to see what other people can do with this and, and see different flavors because uh, I'm, I'm just I'm trying to show off what I know and what I use. Um, I can't, there's, there's, there's infinite ways to, to do similar things, I'm, I'm very okay. sure. So. I yeah, I'd love to see a different way to do this. So, um, one last question for you, which yeah, is, so I'm familiar with Argo. Absolutely love their stuff. I know that they uh, Argo CD gets brought up a lot yep. in uh, with in competition to uh, the what my friend works on, which is Flux over at WeaveWorks. Yeah. Uh, my question is, do you know what the analog would be for a workflow that you were bringing up would be in Flux, just just to have a Name drop I don't, uh, comparison. Okay. I don't know. I so I I'll, we also use Flux um, in in my professional life. Um, I use Argo workflows um, for batch processing, and then Flux for CI/CD. So from what I understand, um, Argo CD is actually built on top of Argo workflows, and it basically enables you to use workflows to do CI/CD. Um, and uh, but I I don't actually care. I actually like Flux better for for CICD anyways. So, um, okay. so I, you know, I don't know what the equivalent, I don't know if there is an equivalent for Flux, but, but if there is, I, I you know, I, I'd be very interested to hear about it. I will let my um, yeah, friend, uh, actually, yeah. Yeah, I'll let my friend Kingdon Barrett, who's like the uh, community uh, person for Flux know that you like his stuff or, or you like Flux over uh, Argo. They love hearing that information. Yeah, yeah for, for specifically for CICD, but uh, but for, for for just batch processing, um, I haven't I, I haven't tried I haven't seen if there's any comparable uh, tooling and technology for just you know straight you know uh, compute on, uh, on 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 kind of our flux ecosystem. But yeah, so anyway, so uh, I will continue on a little bit here just just for 
um, just to show a little bit of time just so we can have this running. And this will take a little bit to run and we can definitely talk more and ask more questions while it runs as well. But just, just to kind of uh, you know, show off what we have. So this is the source code. There is a total of 47 lines of Python. And I know not everyone's a programmer here, but I feel like if, if I could at least keep the, the, the programming to a very simple level that uh, you know, I should, hopefully I should lose too many people. So basically what I have here is I have a really stupid main function and I take the two arguments and then uh, map. If, it, if you pass in map, uh, it'll go into this map. And if you pass in, uh, if you don't pass in map, it'll go through NARGs and it'll run through all of the images you pass to map. And so all this does here is it just glob. And what glob does, if it, people aren't familiar with, it's just basically like wrapping through a directory and it just matches everything with uh, regular expressions that match that pattern. Uh, and so I just have it matching everything in the slash data directory that's either JPEG, JPEG, or ping. And uh, then I'm putting I'm splitting them to four so that we will get uh, we'll get four lists here. So that what that'll do that, that does is it's going to make the equivalent of four nodes. Now you can split this two different ways. Um, I, right now I have it set so it's only going to make always going to make four nodes, partially because this potentially could be my real money here. <laughs> I don't want to accidentally spool up, you know, three hundred nodes accidentally because I've certainly done that before. Uh, but you know, it, it's much more interesting to go the other way where you say. However many images, I'm just going to throw 100 uh, images per node. And if there's 10 billion of them, we'll spool up a lot of pods. Now, one of the things you can be a little more, more savvy is when you write your workflow, you can say, hey, don't spool up more than 10 pods for this step. So then what it'll do is it'll spool up 10 pods. You know, if there's, a you know, if there's 600 pods worth of work, right? In a hundred image per pod or whatever. It'll spool up 10 pods at a time, let them all finish processing. As they finish their little bit of work, once one pod finishes, it'll pull up the next pod's worth of work. So then it'll go through, you know, your 6,000 images, you know, 600 at a time on six different pods or whatever. And you can see they have a pretty nice GUI for that coming up here. So um, all this works is, Argo workflows um, for their with parameters thing. It just expects a JSON dictionary. And the JSON dictionary, or that is, yeah, uh, not even a dictionary, it's a multi uh, uh, double nested array. Sorry. So, uh, and basically, the double nested array is each array in the list is, uh, is uh, the work for a node, the parameters for a node. So each, each node gets its own array of parameters. And so you just Print a double nested array to the screen, and then um, and then you just say your your with parameters thing that I showed before. It'll automatically read that double nested array and then dynamically spool up uh, pods based on that double nested array. That's what's going on here. And so then just back to the YAML again, where that gets applied in the YAML is again um, this thing up here it should be towards the top. I don't know. See, I clicked the wrong one. I got the volume. Sorry. I go to this YAML here. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, it's hard for me to see. Okay, so if you go to the top, it says um, with param output results. So result is just going to be whatever I turned on the screen. And I'm just saying with this with param here is spool up one of these images or one of these containers for each uh, for each parameter in that array. And then again, right here, this is the thumbnailer. It just Saying take this Docker image I have with this Python command and then just do basically it's going to run the Python args then on on whatever gets sent to it. So that's what that is. And then the Docker file is really 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 dumb. Uh, it's essentially it's Python twenty two oh four and then it's saying install Python and pip and then it's just installing Pillow and then Py and then Pillow is just like the very most basic image processing library for Python. And NumPy is, all I'm doing is that, that's how I split my um, pods into, into my array split. It says split the four list. There's one function in there that's really nice called array split. I'm using that, I'm using NumPy for one function here. So it's really basic. Okay, so then to apply all of this, um, I use, I'm using what's gonna, I'm gonna use what's called the Argo CLI here. Uh, but you can also, Really simple, use something, you can also do kubectl, 
get workflows. And so this is what's called a custom resource definition. So job and pod and, and PDC, those are all resource definition objects. So a custom resource definition is just a, an extension made one. And so you can see get workflows here, there says there's no workflows right now, but there could be. Um, and then I, I really like this Argo uh, CLI here that does all the same things, it just prints it out prettier. So this is the- You got command.com for Argo. Oh, you really, you seriously? Command.com. Well, that's dumb. Well, maybe we can demo uh, installing the Argo command here, huh? So uh, let's just do install Argo CLI Linux. It should just be a simple throwaway. Oh, is this your cloud shell station? Purple link. Go to the purple link. Uh, I, think one. One. I think this one is actually going to work. Because that's EKS workshop, and I don't. Uh, I think I really want the GitHub. It's the best when you find your history for something you missed like two days before. I think I just, it, it, I think this is Argo CD. Um, it's really annoying. So you sleep for some days. You have a link. You have no recollection of what you put there. Like, how many years ago is this? Let me we'll just do quick start Argo workflows. Yeah, okay, install Argo CLI. Here we go. Go to the releases page. Hey, Bing GPT, how to install. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this should be really simple. It should just go to the Linux command. We'll just curl this. So I did this on a different computer. That's why it's not in my history. Uh, yeah, OK. So now uh, I really shouldn't have done it in the CIA log folder, but that's fine. So I think we're now just going to unzip it. So Hopefully we have a gun zip in the cloud shell here. If there isn't, it would be sad. But I think I can just add install actually here anyways. So I think this is Ubuntu based. You don't have a uh, file where directly for Argo. Yeah, see what's actually there. Oh, okay, let's so see. Yeah. SP head. Oh, you curled it, you didn't put it into a package. Or did it? No, oh, you it's might be. I don't know what those options are. Yeah. You might need to recurl it. I don't know if your home director, if that home folder you had might it. Might have to get Yeah. And you might need to get it as well. I don't well, know. Just no. try whatever they recommend to start with. Yeah. I don't think they're doing anything too special about this. Okay. Right. Well, so, yeah, we just in the wrong directory. That's all that's going on. Okay, so now we should be able to do that same gun zip command if it's in my history here. Come on, have a gun zip. There we go. And now it should just be move this to user bin, I think is the next uh, yeah. it's not about it. Uh, yeah, that's important. Yeah. So chmod. Also, as a call out while you're doing that, uh, the cube CPL, you'll sometimes hear uh, weirdos call it cube cuddle. Yes. Huh. That's everyone, awesome. Everyone except me calls it cube cuddle. It's like, I no, just think it's the most gross. Everyone, everyone who doesn't like go to KubeCon and try to make, you know, Kubernetes extra friendly tends to call it cube CTL. The only people who call it cube cuddle are the ones who are like constantly in front of people and just because they, they don't care about tech. They care about how they look doing techy things. So anyways, uh, I now have my Argo CLI uh, bit. Uh, so I have, but this, this will just basically give us a nice, um, basically two E type display. Um, you could totally do this all with kubectl. Um, uh, you just, uh, but, but, uh, and it'll do everything, it just won't look as pretty. Uh, and so I think it'll be a little more confusing to see what's going on if you do it with kubectl. But, um, so now the trick is, now I just do, uh, so if I just cd, I'm in SP Headly, I'll do cd thumbnailer, because that's where the YAML file should be. So now I just do Argo submit, and then I just called it thumbnailer YAML, that's the YAML file we've been looking at. I go submit the YAML. So, I, I think guess. you get your B and your M mixed up on submit. Yeah, I did. 
Okay, Argo submit. We'll try again. Okay, it says it spit it out. So then what we'll do here is I'll do Argo logs dash F thumb nailer. And so this basically just is going to spit out all the logs from everything as it runs, and it'll show a different color per node. And then I'll do the other thing here that you can do is you can do Argo watch thumbnailer. And so then this is going to be hard to read because the resolution is bad here. Uh, but yeah, okay. Um, okay, so let's see if we can. Um, okay, so basically top here, uh, this is actually the top. The, the other is a previous. Maybe I should clear. No, I think it'll automatically go. Dang it. Scrolly bit. Okay. So basically, this is the top here. And uh, it's saying we're running Thumbnailer on the default namespace. And uh, we're created it here. And then one of the things you can do is you can tag these and like add tags and arguments to these so you can see some metadata as well. And then if you scroll down here, oh, come on. No. I might control C this and then run the watch again. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So maybe I'll run the get. So we don't. We won't see it live, but uh, you'll get the idea. Just because it's live updating, so then it fights my scrolling. <laughs> oh, right. So, um, and then what I'll do is I'll clear, so we don't see all that. Okay. So this is what it looks like. And if you can get it, so it all shows up reasonably on the same screen, it's much more pleasant to look at. And clear apparently did jack nothing. Uh -huh. Okay, so down here you'll just see is I'll have the map, which completed here. And as soon as it finishes map, it spits out, here's all of the pods that it spun up. And you can see here what the arguments have passed the pods. So this is the basically that glob of all the different images. So you can see that each, each pod got roughly 10, 15 images here. And we spooled up, looks like more than four pods. So, no, there's four. No, there's four. There's four. Okay, so we spooled up, we, there's four pods. Um, actually, none of them are spooled up right now because it says it's unschedulable. So right now it's it's scaling up the cluster. So if I go over here, you can see I have this, no, no, I, uh, well, let's duplicate this tab. You want to click duplicate tab. So if I catch this right, you can see it be at almost no C CPUs, and you can see the CPUs come up. So if I go to Google Compute Engine here, you can see that there's total two vCPUs. And then I will go back here, and let's do get thumbnailer. Oh, and you can see it already, it actually already finished that quickly, that it's probably scaled up and scaled down that quickly. Um, now, what I can do here is just, just because that went by really quickly and, and I was having uh, basically demo issues, what I can do here is I can just do um, delete thumbnailer and we can run the whole thing again. And it'll just overwrite the thumbnails, but that's fine. Um, so you can see here, um, each one of those different colors, each different colors from a different pod. Apparently, I did very much interesting uh, logging into the actual worker itself. So you see the big top dark blue thing, that's the mapper. And then each of these other colors, I think it's two that are pink. That's just like the, the like, hey, I finished. And there was no error. Um, so the, all the different colors are just the log outputs from the other different nodes. If there's more like interesting logging that was going through here, and what I probably should have done is like just printed out which which image I was which uh, image I was resizing, um, you would see you know some green, some blue, some green, some blue, and you, that's basically muxing all of the logs from all the different pods as they run in real time, which is I think is really fun to look at. I just I one of the things that one of my favorite things at work to do is just have one thing just being like the list of all we've been chugging through and then just reams of logs coming at me and just, I feel cool when I watch it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of work at once. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually my legit reason is like, I'm actually looking at the logs to like, something is gonna blow up here somewhere. And I, you know, two minutes from now it's gonna blow up. I don't know exactly when, but sometime soon it's gonna blow up. So then it can blow up, then it can blow up. Ah, there it blew up, that's, that's my bug guy. You know, I should buy that curly bracket or whatever. 
so yeah, it's a little bit of a curly bracket. <laughs> the Python is a lot of curly brackets to, to get, but you get the idea. For caps. Sure. Okay, so I just submitted another one again. We're, we're spending some more of my club books. And uh, we, well, I'll just do a watch here. And we should be able to have a slightly more interesting watch of it live now. Come on. Okay, so now you can see it's a map. So it's it's initializing the map. So what pod initializing means usually is it's downloading a container image. Okay, so now it, it finished mapping everything out. And it, they see the little green checkbox that's kind of small to read, but it's popped as a green checkbox. And then you can see the four different pods. And then you should be able to see now that each one of these four different pods says unschedulable because there's not enough memory or CPU. So now what's going on in the cluster in the background, if I switch over here, is you should be able to see if I refresh, this should start moving past two CPUs and it should start having more. So it says eight now. So we just we just went from two to eight CPUs. And then you should start seeing these uh, thingamajiggers here. They'll start turning blue and or green as they finish. So, oh, yep. Yeah, yeah. So you can see there's at least one that's running right now. I don't know if you can see at the top, one of them is blue. So that one that's blue, that, oh no, that's the top one actually, never mind. Anyways, so that, they'll, they'll start turning blue any second now. Um, and, uh, and then they'll turn blue and then they'll turn green. Now, um, just due to not throwing very much data at it, and when you're doing a completely cold start and I'm not warming up the cluster, sometimes that I've run this through and I've run this through a few times, sometimes it'll come through and it'll actually just blue, green, blue, green, blue, green. It looks like it's running completely sequentially. Obviously, that's not what we're wanting here. That's not the point. <laughs> but uh, sometimes just it, it, you get unlucky and that will happen. But in the ideal situation here is all of these turn blue at the same time, and then they all turn green at the same time. Because the whole point here is, again, scale out, run multiple you know, workers at once. Um, and uh, yeah. And then you can also see what it's doing right now with pod initializing. So it, it scaled up the cluster. So each one of these got a node. So the auto scaler from Google or whatever scaled up all the nodes. So there are nodes available for right now. What it's doing right now with pod initializing, it's just downloading the Docker container image to each of the pods on each of those nodes. And that should take, take, okay, now we have two of them are running right now. So now two of them finished downloading the Docker image and now they're actually processing the images. So, um, and they're running. And then you see those two finished and then the next two immediately triggered on and uh, and now they'll process and then they'll turn green. And I think part of what might be going on here too is I think Google is being a little bit smart on me. And as I think they're re they realized that like I didn't throw enough data at this to justify spinning up all four nodes. First, you know they're trying to save me money and be as efficient as possible. Now, like you really have two two nodes worth of data. We're just going to run two and then two sequentially because you really don't need it that much faster. I don't know if that's true, but uh, I think there's like some. Some like back pressure or whatever kind of thing going on. Yeah, I think there's some like back pressure that it like it's, I don't think it's based on exactly how much data I threw in it. I think it's based on the time that the nodes are running. So I think that it like it'll spool up two nodes and wait a little bit, see if you're you know you have a bursty workload that's going to you know scale down again, Good. and then and then it'll wait you know okay you got two nodes worth okay you still have you know extra loads you're waiting on we're going to scale up two more and then it's like well no you still have a little bit more let's scale up eight you know what i mean like i think it's i, I don't know exactly the other some I mean. assumptions about its average runtime time or something yeah so i think it, it does like to like and i noticed that the different behavior on amazon versus google versus on-prem um if you're on-prem and you already have all the resources it just fires up there's everything no let's go yeah there's no auto scaling so it's just like let's go immediate let very satisfying focuses all the things. Uh, Google apparently seems to have a thing where it like scales up one, scales up two, like it, it just slowly scales up as your as your continuous load keeps going. And then yeah. And then if you I think it's gonna scales down as your as you know as things come down. And then if you just have bursty loads, you know, then it, you don't scale up eight things that run for a couple seconds. I think it's efficient for them too. So so I think that's what's going on here. So this is this is uh, what I consider a successful, successful run. Um, just to show you that it actually did something. Remember, I deleted that thumbs directory. Um, I can get back into my little debugger pod somewhere. Oh, and I, I did that in the other tab. And I'm going to go through the history just because I'm too lazy to type all that out again. And for maybe for just a time. 
So I should have my little script that uh, logs us back into the pod. To connect the pod. Okay, so this is my connected pod shell script again. We're uh, oh, okay. So I am in that directory now. So I don't need to do thumbnail or slash. I just do connect to pod. Let's do. Sorry. Okay, so now we're in the pod, and I do ls slash data, and you should see that really bright green thing you can't read. That's the thumbs directory it created, and. Uh, and then if I do ls slash data thumbs, that's all of our um, images that are now shrunk to, um, they're scaled down to 500 pixels, keeping the same aspect ratio. If you really want, uh, what I can do is there's a command called kubectlcp, which allows you to basically do like an RCP, basically, like it's like a, it's a, basically you can copy data from into your pods. So I can show you that where I can, copy these back down to the cloud shell again, and then I can copy them back down to my machine and you can see they're smaller. But if you'd like to see them, I'd be happy to show over me. Um, if you're like, I just trust you, they're smaller. And uh, you know, that's a lot of you know, rigor and roll for, for not that much payoff, but you, know, uh, you can trust they're smaller because I did do all this at home and they are smaller. You could do just a simple ls-lh. Uh, size. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. size of each five. But you increase the quality so they have the same five size. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Let's do slash data. How hard is it to get just one? So, okay, so you can see, let's just do Arch 45 here as our benchmark. You can see that Arch 45 is 2.7 megabytes. Okay, let's just do ls slash data slash thumb. And let's do Arch 45. And you can see Arch 45 now has 174K. Uber small, very thumbnail. Yay. So, uh, and then, you know, if I just do, you know, star or whatever, we can, we can look at all of them. Uh, arrow key. Why is the arrow key not work? <laughs> the, the internet died? Oh, 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 okay. Well, had a minor internet hiccup there, but at least it's towards the end. So yeah, so uh, you can see like all of these, and before above here, you had a bunch of things in the megabyte range. Uh, oh, uh, maybe in the megabyte range. I don't know. Yeah, a handful. Yeah, make, yeah, they're relatively small images anyways. Um, but anyways, then you can see down here, they're much, much smaller. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I have, and this is, um, just basically in my day job, I do a lot of image processing. This is like the dumbest image processing ever. So, you know. Yeah, you paid the big bucks for this. Yeah. So I know I don't think anyone gets paid the big bucks for make writing thumbnails, but you know, but potentially like one thing you could do in your personal life is let's say you have a whole bunch of things you'd be handbreaking. You could very simply do something with FFmpeg. And instead of just FFmpeg on your one computer, you know, write a real quick, you don't even write a placement script, you can write a bash script to do your to uh, basically, you know, write a script that, like, you know, lists out the videos you're going to FFmpeg um, to a JSON array. And as long as that gets sent to standard out, you can, you know, just switch your, so your arguments, you know, write add your arguments that go along with each other. Yeah. And basically, like, you know, you just have to have, you know, the batch arguments that go along with each one. And basically, then you can spool up an entire computer to run each FFmpeg video. So you have a hundred videos you want to re-encode to you know, some new codec you're, you know, you want to go from H264 to H265 or whatever. You can spool up, you know, a hundred videos, you can spool up a hundred computers to do that all at once instead of having to have your one computer at your desk just turn through them one at a time. So you know, uh, you know, there's still, I think there's some as just day-to-day. -day, you know, Linux user, there's there's potential for this being useful for folks, you know, even outside of you know more commercial business type activities. It's kind of a nice tool to have in your cool toolbox, especially if you already you know have using Kubernetes for you know hosting, um, you know, let's say you're hosting web servers or whatever, right? You have different web apps you're hosting or databases or something you're hosting on Kubernetes, anyways. Well, here's just another way you can use Kubernetes to you know, take advantage of maybe spare cycles in your, your home cluster or whatever to, to you know, do something useful. 
And how did you install uh, Argo into the cluster since it doesn't come? Yeah, so uh, I can show you the quick start guide here. I think we even have it up right now. Um, so if you look under the releases here, so um, I we, the thing we just curled was the Argo Linux um, GZ here, I believe, which is just their CLI. But if you look to see, one of the things is install YAML. So this install YAML, I just download this install YAML, and then I did kubectl apply dash f, which is exactly what we got our pod deployment before. Is I just it's a YAML file, just like our little debug pod deployment we did, and uh, you just do uh, kubectl apply dash f that, and it will just set it all up for you. There's a little bit of extra business in the very most recent versions where you also have to do RBAC. So there's an RBAC command. Um, I can show you that RBAC. It's very easy to Google. But there's an extra like, so RBAC is just like a security permission thing. So that it used to be by default, they let everyone do everything on Argo. And now they're like, well, maybe we don't want people to be able to spin up more nodes. We want to be able to do whatever. There's an extra little RBAC to make this demo work that basically allows you to spend more money more easily. <laughs> Use more resources more easily than I had to apply, but um, it's very simple as well. Cool. All and right. I, actually, one thing that you can do is I can actually show you this YAML file. And if you know anything about uh, anything about Kubernetes, you can see that it's really just pods. There's a workflow controller pod and a deployment and everything. And my case, oh, it wants you to, because it's in a, it's in a, it wants you to open That's an arm. And just, can you open this in VS Code? Oh, no, we can do VIM. This is GVIM. That's fine. You can, you can make GVIM work. Uh, so yeah, so then you can see um, we should just have deployments and pods. So this is this this is a group. I oh, know this is a custom research definition. So remember, I told you that Argo flows is a custom research definition. So this is defining the custom resource definition, and then you should see that there's another thing here, more custom resource definition stuff. So this is doing cron workflows. And that's thing you can do is you can schedule workflows to run like every day at a certain time. So let's say. You're like want to check for work every hour. You can check for work on like a staging directory or whatever, or read from a Kafka queue or something every hour or whatever. And then uh, if there's work, process it. If there's not work, don't do anything. So that's that's cron workflows. That's another custom resource in this that's installed for you. Um, and then there's uh, you could have workflow templates, which is like basically you have a workflow and then you like like have something predefined and then you can like um, pick and choose different options on it, uh, which is really useful because they have a GUI. So if you have a bunch of things that, you know, you have a bunch of users that they want to do X, Y, Z, like process X, Y, Z data, satellite data, whatever, you know, whatever, some sort of data that they want to upload new or whatever, like, or they want to have a to do this. Clean your interface. Yeah, so they, they, have, they have a UI. So if you define a template, they, they have a UI where you can like select the template and then fill out with a with drop down menus everything in the template and then push go and then it will pull up you know hundreds of computers for you. Anyways, mm -hmm. yeah, not to go into this too long, but this is actually not a terrible way to like tell you about all the different other features. Um, I don't know what a workflow list is. Um, there's not a, I don't know everything, obviously. And this is a stain, like this is a this is standard for any step. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly this is. And if, if I was going to load, deploy my own little like web app, it would look exactly like this. Though it, you probably have deployments instead of custom resource definitions, but yeah, anyone can write any of this stuff. Through these. And so, and like one of the interesting things about this is this also has, um, once you get to the deployments further down, it has all of the individual versions for each of the controllers and, and API servers and whatnot. So one of the things that you can do with this is you can come in here and you can edit this. And you can just change all the versions. So you say, hey, I want API server XYZ, but I want workflow controller server other version. And you can basically uh, redeploy it, and it'll just apply the things that change. It has kind of an um, item potent kind of deployment uh, lifecycle thing. So if you deploy something and it's already likely, it won't change it. So you can just change it to be However, we'll slightly different you want it, just redeploy it and it'll just change just the things that you want to. That makes change. sense when you're not like destroying things that are actively. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, anyway, so that's that's what I have, just kind of a basic intro to Kubernetes and specifically Kubernetes for batch processing. 
And uh, yeah, uh, happy to field any more questions that came up while I was talking, or if you're tired of me talking, you know, you're I welcome seen, to have somebody else talk, throw out too. Yeah, I haven't seen any more uh, questions come across that haven't already been handled. Uh, Will, I'm sure you have something to chime in. No, this is pretty awesome. I have good, Argo's been on my to-do list for a while, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and if anyone does anything cool with it uh, in the future, uh, you know, it's probably Will's probably the most likely, but if, you know, anyone gets any inspiration or does anything cool, I'd love to hear about it. And, uh, I, you know, I've been doing a fair bit of this and I, I, and for my for my role and job work, and I've recruited Andy to do a little bit of it from time to time, too. And I thought it was particularly timely we were talking about why would anyone want to do a loop in a YAML file? And, you know, that's exactly what I had to plan to show in a demo. So, yeah, I thought that was hilarious. It was yeah. like, oh, yeah, yeah there is. <laughs> so, uh, and I think that one of the, so I talked about there's another project called Kubeflow, which is built on top of this. And what Kubeflow is, is basically making a Python API on top of the um, these YAMLs. So if for whatever reason you really don't want to do declarative, you can use uh, Python's uh, the imperative API or, you know, imperative you know, interface. Yeah, uh, I think it's a domain specific language. ESL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. so you can use that instead. So well, at this point, I'm going to stop the recording and we're going to go into the app.